Holy Spirit, filling me up to the top of my soul. Filling me up, come the Holy Spirit, filling me up now and take control. Filling me up, come the Holy Spirit, come. Filling me up, Holy Spirit, oh, come. My heart is an open door. Filling me up, come the Spirit, come. Filling your Spirit is welcome, Lord. Filling me up, come the Holy Spirit, come. my heart flow and let it grow. Filling me up, come the Spirit, come. Change my life so I will know. Fill my heart, fill my heart you, you come, come and fill me up, come the Holy Spirit, fill me up to the top of my soul, fill me up, come the Holy Spirit, fill me up now and take control, fill me up now and take control, fill my heart, come Spirit, fill me up, fill me up. Gracious Spirit, dwell with me, I would gracious be. Help me now thy grace to see, I would be like thee. And with words that help and heal, my life would mine reveal. And with actions bold and meek, for Christ my Savior speak. Truthful spirit, dwell with me, I would truthful be. Help me now my truth to see, I would be like thee. And with wisdom kind and clear, thy life is mine appear. And with actions lovingly, speak Christ's sincerity. Spirit, dwell with me, I would holy be. Show thy mercy tenderly, make me more like thee. Separate from sin I would and cherish the things good. And whatever I
morning here at Robinsdale Parkway UCC and good morning online on Facebook and YouTube. We are so glad that you are all here with us in whatever way you are here with us. Um, uh, there's lots going on today. I'm not going to take up too much time. I just want to mark that today is, uh, we're acknowledging the two-year anniversary of um, going into COVID lock lockdowns. And um, we had worship here two years ago on this day with kind of a sparse crowd. And the next week, we had just me and Kathy and Steve. <laughs> and, uh, and so then we were adapting along the way. Um, and next, next week, we will honor that that's going to be our two-year anniversary of that experience. And we'll honor those losses of life, of safety, of trust, of community, of friendships. Um, and we begin that understanding of our loss by hanging of the paper cranes. You can still make them after church uh, and add to this wonderful display of hope and understanding of these losses. So um, participate in that ministry as you see fit. Um, I need to remind folks that it is food share month, so uh, take a bag, right? No, they want bags. They want paper bags and money. So <laughs> lots of ways to give as well for that. Um, I also want to introduce you to these, uh, these women who are next to me on this, on this tapestry. Um, this is uh, the Red Sea Band. Uh, the woman in the middle on the top is Miriam, who led the Red Sea Band, right? If you know your, your book of Exodus story well. And, and she brought tr trimble and, and dance and harp and, and lyre. And, and it was a wonderful celebration of liberation. And um, along the way, uh, other biblical women said, hey, I want to be in your band. And also on the tapestry then are Tamar, great story in scripture, look it up. Hagar is in there. Mary Magdalene joins the band a little while later. And then Lydia is the last one to join the band. She's one of the uh, leaders of the early church. Um, and she said she wanted to play the electric guitar in the band. And, <laughs> and, a, and the artist said, uh, Lydia, there's no electricity in the ancient world. And, uh, and Lydia said, that's your problem. I'm, I'm playing the electric guitar, and so there you go. Um, so uh, this is going to be hung in Heritage Hall as a spiritual piece. So you can go and look and talk to these women and, and hear their stories a little bit more. Um, and uh, just to know that that's going to be a, 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 in a place of honor here in the church for a little while. Uh, the artist Janet Hagberg is a friend of mine, and she said you can take have it as long as uh, the women dance and sing. So. Let that be part of our ministry. Um, Diane, would you tell us a little bit about this great offering coming up in two weeks? And I lost another quarter of an inch, too, at my last. Well, <laughs> Connor sets that up, and Connor's taller than I am, so yeah. So at uh, the end of this month, on the last Sunday, March 27th, we are going to collect a special offering for the wider church ministries of the UCC. This Sunday is, that Sunday is called One Great Hour of Sharing, and it is shared by many Christian churches to help support their ministries that help in disasters and with refugees and with developmental, development ministries in the world. So, on the back of your bulletin, there is instructions on how you can give. And we'll make that collection, the whole offering, right, on the 27th? Is, yeah. 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 And, and you could do it any time, but that's, that's yeah. going to be our big day. And I have a, a second one. I want to thank everyone who volunteered and or donated to our blood drive on Tuesday. Our preliminary number is 46 units of blood. So, if you are here and you donated and or volunteered, stand up, please. Yay. Yes. All right. Thank you. And put in the comment in the chat, if you're online in ministry, that you were part of that blood drive. Really important work. Dawn. T, T made most of my um, announcement, but I just wanted to say, especially for those online, if you would like to participate, and we would love for you to, my email is in the bulletin. Um, I will be glad to um, send you out instructions and paper, and they can be just folded in half 
and mail to church. So we want everyone to be included. Thank you. Yay. Other announcement-y kind of things before I shift into joys and concerns. Obviously, I'm, I'm Reverend T. Michael Rock, one of the pastors here. My cohort in ministry, uh, Kathy Itzen, is on vacation this week celebrating her anniversary with Carol, and so we lift them up. Um, and as I get to joys and concerns, I think the first joy is going to be Esme. Can, can I say it, Esme? Yeah? It's pretty cool. Esme's birthday was yesterday. And now she's off on the Starship Enterprise. So. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's important. Easter's coming. Apparently. I know. Good morning. I'm Char Mertz. Um, we have Easter flowers sign up. Kathy Jo is at the table. Um, there are five different kinds of flowers. They're six-inch pots. They're $20 a piece. Um, you can sign up for those that are at home that are watching. If you want to sign up for a flower, you can email me at finance at rpucc.org and you can pay online and I will add an online line fund that says Easter flowers. But make sure in the notes you tell me which one you're ordering. So um, sign up. The deadline is April 4. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Other... Um, we'll go to Joy's concern. So Joy is Esme's birthday. Uh, we're going to keep uh, Dick Larson in our prayers. He's got surgery coming up, um, and we'll, but we'll see him next week before surgery, right? Yeah. We're, we're, we're loving you on you, Dick. It's going to be great. Um, other joys and concerns we can share with the church. Marcia, can I? Um, so Marcia and Jim Benchuf are here from Arizona, so, and boy, are their arms tired. Um, <laughs> But uh, Marcia's here, uh, her mom is, we've been including her in our prayers for many weeks now, um, but is uh, ending her life and moving into transition, and so they're here to kind of help her through that and help each other through that. So prayers for Marcia and her mom. Other joys and concerns we can share, obviously, prayers for folks in Ukraine and other places that are dealing with war, including those wars in our streets, and prayers also for the teachers, and may they find a way to get back to the kids they uh, have de devoted their lives to. Um, it is about the kids after all, and that's what they're fighting for. So we have to remember that and, and hope there's resolution for the strike. Other pieces. Then let us remember that um, part of our commitments to justice and understanding of our own lives is that um, we carry a shared history and that we honor that in 1893 Robbinsdale was established as a faith community we recognize that our church resides on stolen land. It was taken illegally from the Sisseton and Wapaton bands of the Dakota during the 1851 Session 289 Treaty. White settlers were responsible for genocide and forced assimilation and systemic violence against Native families and nations who lived in these regions, whether they knew it or not, right? We who are non-native confess that our ongoing colonization of the land is unjust and that our broken relationships with the land is a root cause of our global climate crisis. We seek to live in a posture of repentance and repair and collectively seek to heal our relationship with the Dakota and Anishinaabe people, with this land and with our own souls. So center yourselves in that posture and take a deep breath. Let your spirit arrive here for worship as we proclaim together Robinsdale Parkway United Church of Christ stands in solidarity with the indigenous community. Friends, neighbors, and caretakers of air, land, and water. May our hearts be open in the spirit of peace to enter into worship.
Please rise as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Let the mountains and prairies hear our voices raised in prayer and praise, wide and awesome God. We gather in the sacred place to honor you and adore you. We come humbly, claiming and proclaiming that in our weakness we are made strong. We give thanks that you lift up the weak, defy the world's foolishness, and invite us to share in life at its fullest and best as Christ's disciples. Help us to accept your invitation. Give thanks for the invitation to the Savior. This poem was written by Amanda Gorman as the pandemic was starting. I thought I'd awaken to a world in mourning, heavy clouds crowding, a society storming. But there's something different on this golden morning, something magical in the sunlight, wide and warming. I see a dad with a stroller taking a jog. Across the street, a bright-eyed girl chases her dog. A grandma on a porch fingers her rosaries. She grins as her young neighbor brings her groceries. While we might feel small, separate, and all alone, our people have never been more closely tethered. The question isn't if we will weather this unknown, but how we will weather this unknown together. So on this meaningful morn, we mourn and we mend. Like light, we can't be broken even when we bend. As one, we will defeat both despair and disease. We stand with healthcare heroes and all employees, with families, libraries, schools, wait, right, waiters, artists, businesses, restaurants, and hospitals hit hardest. We ignite, not in the light, but in lack thereof. For it is in loss that we truly learn to love. In this chaos, we will discover clarity in suffering we must find solidarity. For it's our grief that gives us our gratitude, shows us how to find hope if we ever lose it. So ensure that this ache wasn't endured in vain. Do not ignore the pain. Give it purpose. Use it. Read children's books. Dance alone to DJ music. Know that this distance will make our hearts grow fonder. From a wave of woes, our world will emerge stronger. We'll observe how the burdens braved by humankind are also the moments that make us humans kind. Let every dawn find us courageous, brought closer, heeding the light before the fight is over. When this ends, we'll all smile sweetly, finally seeing in testing times, we became the best of beings.
Okay. Have you ever made a promise to someone? Have you made a promise? And were you able to keep that promise as best as you could? Mm hmm. Sometimes? Yep. Um, so, in, in our story from the Bible today, there are two people Abram and Sarah, Abram's wife. And they're really, really old. Like, Abram's 106. And Sarah's 102. I can't even imagine being that old or seeing people that old. Well, that would be really old. And they didn't have any kids when they were younger. And they really wanted kids. And so they asked God. Abram says, we really wanted to have kids and we didn't have any. And I'm really kind of bummed out. And so is Sarah. And so God says, I promise that you will have a child. And Abram said, how could that possibly be? We're so old. And God said, have faith in me, and I promise that you'll have a child. And they did. They had a son. And God kept their promise. And I made promises. I made promises to my children. They're all grown up now. But I made promises to them that I would always do my best to help them. And I would always do my best to make sure that they had everything they needed. And I've made promises to my friends, too. And I've made promises to God, telling God, I will do my very best to be a really good person and to help others and to pray for others and make sure that I do what I can do to make sure that everybody around me has the things that I can possibly give them that they need. And so I have this covenant. Do you know what covenant means? Covenant means, that's a big word, means to be together, like we're together with God, and we're together with Jesus, and we're together with each other, and having all the faith that we have together. And so I continue to promise that I'm going to do the best that I can do. And I hope that as you grow up and you make more promises that you're able to do the very best that you can do to keep those promises, and you can always rely on God and pray to God, help me keep my promise. I'm going to do my best, and God will say, excellent. So should we have a little prayer? Okay. Loving, God, Loving God, thank you for keeping your promises to us. We love you and think about you every day. And we're going to do our very best to keep our own promises. Amen. Can you hold this while I get up? Hey. So one of the things we often do during Lent is to hear stories and to hear a witness to what faith and life and how those intersections happen. And our worship team chose this question for our faith witnesses this season. And there are a couple open spots. If you feel inspired by uh, this amazing Lenten witness, um, you uh, can certainly talk to me or Kathy and we'll get you on the schedule. But the question is, how has your faith adapted to an experience? Maybe it's a traumatic experience or some life-changing experience that helped you to grow in your faith. What happened in your life that actually made faith more meaningful? And so those are the questions that you will hear about as we explore adaptation as a spiritual foundation of our lives. Cindy Bergstrom. Good morning. So when the pastors asked me to speak this morning, um, I, th I knew exactly what I was going to talk about. Um, but the first thing I did was look up what exactly does adaptation mean. So I looked up several different definitions, and here's what I found. The act or process of changing to better suit a situation, to make suitable 
to requirements or conditions, adjust or modify fittingly, and to adjust oneself to different conditions, environment, etc. As I think about how my faith has adapted over the years, it of course is reflected in my maturity as a person, but certain points in my life, as for many of us, it took challenging times to really figure out what my faith was made up of. But now I always try to make sure it starts from a place who God, of who God is and living with Jesus as my example, knowing that it's me who has to adapt and not God. My faith has adapted from the inherited faith of growing up with the traditional liturgy of, the, of my small town Lutheran church, which I loved, to as a teenager discovering contemporary Christian music, Amy Grant, anyone? <laughs> and how that changed my perspective of what faith was, a personal relationship with Jesus. In college, my philosophy class looked at other religions but I still found myself back with the God I knew through Jesus. Music was always a big part of those adaptations. As an adult, I shared my faith with the children I taught in choirs throughout the years. I had attended Bible study fellowship for several years and felt that this in-depth diving into the Bible had really solidified my faith. Then one day the teacher was speaking on a passage in Romans and said straight out, homosexuality is wrong. I should have known to walk out right then. I realized that the theology of this group was not the God that I knew. I was very disappointed. Then came the day that changed our family and shaped my faith in so many ways and I share this story with permission of my child. It was New Year's Day, 2017. Our youngest teenage child came to my husband and me with something to say, and he couldn't get it out. And so I said, well, can you write it down? So he went in the other room and took the notepad and wrote two words, and then quickly went back to his room. When my husband and I went in the room and looked at the notepad, it simply said, I'm trans. For many months, uh, he, now she, didn't want to talk about it, as neither did my husband. And they both are people that process things internally. And I'm very much the opposite. I like to talk about it. And so that was excruciating for me. That was very, very difficult. Um, the silence I suffered into led to a long, serious, depressive episode. But in the midst of it, God was still speaking. Something amazing happened. At my church at the time, the wife of a musician friend who I had worked closely with for many years there came to me and told me that her husband was transitioning to female. Wow, God had heard my crying out. I spoke with this friend and we hugged long and hard. I felt terrible that she had suffered for so long, but I also felt God wrapping me up in that same hug. I told this friend about our child and she said that one of the reasons they had stayed at the church was because she figured that statistically there had to be at least one young person in the youth group that she could help. When her, when her wife told her about that, she said, we found the missing link. God had put this family into our lives to help me understand that it would be all right. Some healing could begin. I could begin to adapt. But I was still struggling. It was a long journey. One day when our older daughter was home from college, I was having a particularly hard time. I was sitting on the couch weeping. And she came to me in her wisdom, in her old soul wisdom. <laughs> um, and she said something that was so important for me to hear at the time and something I've gone to, back to often. We aren't losing our child, 
She would still be the same person, everything we loved about her, her sense of humor, her compassion, everything would still be there. She may look a little different, but she wasn't going to disappear. Another step in the healing and adapting. But there was this other issue at hand. There were rumblings within our denomination about churches who had clergy who were officiating at weddings of same-sex couples. It occurred to me that I wasn't even aware of our denomination's stance on gay marriage, as they were very open about issues that weren't basic tenets of Christianity. Apparently, they weren't very open on this one, and they had a policy that I didn't agree with. About half of our congregation was just as shocked and dismayed as I was. As major discussions swirled, eventually a large foundational church was booted out of the de denomination in a very unloving way. Where would our particular church land on this issue? After a painful couple of years, they decided to declare that they were welcoming to everyone, but couldn't officiate or host same-sex weddings to remain in the good gr graces of the denomination. A new pastor came on board and she acknowledged that the whole issue was handled very poorly by the denomination, but the denomination was digging in its heels even harder and wouldn't even open the door to renewed conversation about the issue. After several other considerations, after more than 20 years at that church, I decided it was time to move on. This was not an easy decision. My husband grew up in the church and we met there. We loved the people there. It would have been easy to let my faith go. There were times I had said, this is all just too difficult. But when I really step back and look at many different painful situations at many different churches, it's the people that created the pain, not God. In the tough moments, it's easy to blame God. That's okay, God can take it. <laughs> but people, even ones that seem to love us, can disappoint us. How, in what we try to make our faithful interpretations of God's word, can we come up with such different conclusions? If there's one thing I've learned in my spiritual adaptations, it's that God is love, period. I can re surround myself with people who understand that and try to be a light to those who aren't there yet. Through all of this, I was grateful that even when I was struggling to make sense of everything, I never doubted that God was there. My strong faith wavered, of course, but I knew that God was patiently waiting for me to find my way back. God waited as long as it took. God's relentless pursuit of me as his child is what kept me hanging on. So, when I think about how my faith has adapted, I remember that it's how God has worked through me to adapt me to the situation this new reality, how I have adapted to the steadfastness of God. Just as my older child said that our younger child would still be there, I know that God is always there, even when I need to adapt. If I let him, God will help me do just that. Amen. Usually I cry when I'm the one telling a story, but that was beautiful. Thanks so much. Oh, man, this is going to be hard to follow up. <clears throat> Please tell your stories. Please sign up to be a witness. <sighs> My wife's laughing right now. Because <clears throat> every time I get up at church, I cry. Ah, It's a good place. It's a good place to do it. It's a good place to do it. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Ah. Hear the word of God. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. <clears throat> After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, who is sometimes called Abraham, in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, for I am your shield. 
your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of, of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. The Spirit of God brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, so shall your descendants be. And Abram believed the Lord. Then God spoke and said, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But Abram said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? The Spirit of God responded, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought God all these and cut them in two as a blood sacrifice. And when the birds of prey came down to the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain, that your offspring shall be aliens in a land that is not theirs, and shall be slaves there, and they shall be oppressed for four hundred years. But I shall bring judgment to the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your ancestors in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the inquiry of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had finally gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these places. On that day, the Lord said, made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gilgashites, and the Jebusites. So ends the reading. Enter my heart, enter my heart, O Spirit of power and love, may I proclaim your holy name, O Spirit, enter my heart. Join me. Enter my heart, enter my heart, O Spirit of power and love. May I proclaim your holy name, O Spirit. That's how I get through the tears. <laughs> Sing a little bit. Um, so yeah, thank you, Cindy. Um, here they come again. Um, what a blessing it is to share a story. And, and really that's what this sermon is about, is how the people, the faithful people, were trying really hard to understand their story, their lives. Now, in the grand pantheon of scripture, sacred scripture, we understand that these first five books called the Law, the Torah, and the Jewish tradition were written by several different authors of different times, of different centuries even. 
And the scholarship says, because they're smarter than I am, <laughs> tells me that this particular story, this Abrahamic story, comes from the priestly writers, the latest of the group of writers that worked on these first five books of Scripture. And I think that the earliest writer, I know that, uh, did the Moses story, right? The, the Moses story was a historical experience of liberation for the people, and it is the centerpiece story for the people of Israel, right? The, he, the, that's, that's the story. It marks time, right? The, the, the year of, in the Jewish tradition is based on when the Red Sea parted and the people were free. That is the story. And along the way, this is pretty common for people who live in this storytelling, oral history kind of world, is we need to find the origin story, right? Those of you who follow Marvel and DC Comics understand origin stories, right? <laughs> Characters pop up and they, they, get, they get popular and people buy those comics and then some writer says, hey, we need to write an origin story for that character. It happens all the time in literature in different, different ways, right? It's how we understand who we are. And so the priestly writers go about writing an origin story for the people of Israel. And a the story of Abram comes out of that wonderful, beautiful, mythopoetic story that describes where people came from and how God was involved in their evolution as people, their adaptations a long time, the way they grew as who they were and, and how rules were broken and how what was most important was these relationships the people carried with God. And so this, the priestly writers set about figuring a mythopoetic story that would include what it meant to be a people on a land in relationship with God. Let's say that again. A people gathered on a certain plot of land in relationship with God. And then that mythopoetic story, based on that transition, becomes, I'm pretty sure, if I know my history right, how every church is created <laughs> for all time. A people gathered in a place <laughs> in relationship with God, right? That, that's kind of, that becomes the formula <laughs> of, the, of the mythopoetic story about who we are. And, I, and so when I, you go back and look at the histories of where we came from as a people who are now Robbinsdale Parkway United Church of Christ, it starts the earliest founding church of these combined congregations is a German church on the north side of Minneapolis. And we know, and they, and they were founded in the 1850s, okay? And we know that history tells us that during the time of the Persian reign in Germany in the, in the mid-1800s, there was a lot of persecution. And if people didn't succumb to the Persian leadership and become churches that changed their message from the gospel to the story of the empire at the time, they were oftentimes burned, killed, and villages were wiped out. German history is not pleasant for people who are going to defy the empire during the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. It was a very violent time to be a German who didn't believe in what was happening with the empire. And so the response for many German folks at that time was to immigrate to this new world and to build people coming together on a place <laughs> to talk about their relationship with God. And then another group of people come, come in and make another place, and then another place. And, and what I, that's what happens when we tell our stories. We have to remember that oftentimes it's the people seeking that sense of liberation because the, the core story in the whole thing is Moses, right? We ask, like, what is the truth about religion? And in my world, in the United Church of Christ, we say, is it liberating? Is it a liberating story? Are you finding freedom in the story? Or, and does it help you be more authentic to yourself? Be free? Those are the questions. I think we heard those questions beautifully in Cindy's story, right? That, that's the questions we always ask. Is, is your mythopoetic story liberating and free? Now, 
I, I teach UCC polity at the seminary, and, and it's one of the, the core values of all of the UCC courses and all over the country is to ask that question. Like, our fundamental understanding is that we have a covenantal polity, that we make promises together to walk in this way, to remember our story, and to continue to ask the question, is, are the actions, the prayers, the poems, oh my God, what a poem. Was that amazing? That was the first time I cried today. Um, uh, I mean, is, are the words we're using, uh, is, are the meetings that we come in contact with, is, are the building programs, are the budgets, are they liberating and freeing? That's the idea. That, that's how we understand that we're United Church of Christ Church. Now, one of the origin stories of the Robbinsdale history, and this is a wonderful origin story, it's in the Robbinsdale history book, is this guy named John Robbins, who was the first mayor of Robbinsdale. We know that because we now have Parker Station Flats, Barb Wills, right, that, that the town was called Parker Station based on the train stop that was here on this land. But John Robbins, who is, who is a leader of that Parker Station world, um, was founding the first church on this land. Founding the first church. Now, this is important. This is, this is 1890, right, is when John's walking around. And he has a choice in the story to become Presbyterian or Congregational. And it was a big decision. And, and there's, there's, a, there's this long John Robbins story about why he chose Congregationalism. And this is the beautiful thing. So in, in the, again... And on this continent, in the white world, in New England, where uh, they had really decimated all indigenous populations for the most part, churches were becoming the center point of, of culture. And in the 1850s, in Connecticut, Horace Bushnell came along the way and said, we are going to start educating everybody who comes in the building to worship God in the covenant of our faith. Everyone needs to know. The children need to know whether you're educated or not need to know. And the best teachers of our oral history are women. And so we're going to make sure women have the most important roles of teaching our covenantal history to everybody in the church. And that message of understanding that education and covenant were really primary, not doctrine, but education and covenant, and John Robbins is moved by this and says, I think this town needs to have a congregational church, not a Presbyterian church. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> right? Now, nothing against Presbyterians, right? They also have a wonderful, glorious history in their own way, mixed bag kind of stuff, but we are grateful that somewhere along the line he understood that that education, that covenantal understanding was going to be what is most foundational for us. The mythopoetic story of Abraham in relationship to God is that God has this way of pursuing Abraham. Abraham has all these doubts. Well, you can't be calling me. You know, you, you must not be my God. How am I supposed to know that you are the one true God? You know, all these kind of doubts. Abraham comes with all this stuff. I'm not kind of ancestors. I'm 106 years old, as Shah reminds us. Right? I mean, that, that's ludicrous. But God makes a covenant. God, God says, you know, Abram, I, I made this covenant to you when you were younger. I'm not going to break that covenant. In the story, right, this is not about whether there was an actual Abraham who was actually 106 years old, right? We know that. Right? Part of mythopoetic stories is you tell the story to get the most jazz out of it, right? <laughs> right? So the story is 106, 102 years old, there's no way they could possibly have kids, and there they go, right? That's what the priestly writers are trying to tell people, is this covenantal story is so important to know that you're in relationship, that God wants you to be gathered as people on this land to make this relationship happen to fulfill these covenantal responsibilities. This is the beauty of what it means to have a mythopoetic story. Now, for those of you who have been in therapy, right? Yeah, woo, therapy, yeah. You know, I mean, that's a great thing because part of that therapy, if you're in a kind of a Jungian model, which pretty much everybody is, um, in some way, like some iteration of, of Jung, um, is to tell your own story, to understand your own mythopoetic journey, to understand your own history. 
If we're going to do racial justice work really well, we have to know where we came from. We have to understand our immigrant story, right? We have to, we have to understand and tell that story in that wonderful mythopoetic way. Understand its, its trials, its sufferings, uncovering all the different things that we probably don't want to talk about. But those are opportunities for healing and justice as well. This is what the people are called to do at every time and place. Which is why when, when the church comes together to, to create the law, the Torah, this most sacred text that, is, that lives in the tabernacle in the, in the Jewish temple and is created with such reverence and awe, it's the story of our life. And it's mirrored in the story of our lives together. It's who we are in covenant with each other, promising to walk in these ways, made and to be made known to us. There is more light and truth to break through from God's holy word, as John Robinson said on the Mayflower as it came across. Little did he know that his story would be that beautiful phrase, but also cause great pain for so many indigenous people. We can hold both of those stories in our mythopoetic journey together. So just like Abram brings that, as Tim beautifully left out, all the details of the blood sacrifice. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> but in the story, all the, all the gritty details are there so that we can understand all the gritty details of our story too. It's all wrapped up in the promises that we carry with each other. What's most important then is to tell those stories, to understand our own story, and that the journey of finding your mythopoetic place in this community is that story of recommitting to membership every year or, or doing something that says, yes, this is, these are my people in my place in relationship to God. This is who we are. Covenants and promises are the bedrock of our faith. And we are grateful beyond measure. And this is and always has been the good news. Amen. Let us sing together.
pray. I wish Kathy were here. <laughs> Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day and this singing community, this, this people that have come together to be in a certain place at a certain time to learn and grow together, to continue to make promises, to con continue to forgive and find new ways of being one. We are called into this place when there's so much conflict in our world and there's so many people who are hurting and there's so many stories that are in pain. We lift up each of them in our hearts. And we know that many of us come into this place sick in body and mind or in spirit. And we ask your presence to be a healing presence, a liberating presence, a presence of freedom and, and hope and joy in each of their lives. May your spirit rest on every being who is here in this place and online. We are all together as one. May these electronic connections continue to find new ways that take us into hope and understanding for this community. And may we find, in the midst of our worship lives together, our singing and our praying, a deep sense of humility. That readiness to, to cry, to feel, to understand that we are all adapting together. And just like Amanda Gorman preaches to us through the beautiful mouth of Katie Knutson, we understand that we are together as one. It is not about being human and kind, but moving into being humans kind. Help us weather the, these rest, hopefully rest of these days of the COVID-19 pandemic with hearts that are open with minds that are ready, and with a life that is devoted to service. And now we combine all of those prayers into the one prayer that you taught us to pray, O oh God, our Father and Mother who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. And the beauty of our time together is that we get to give in response, to open our hearts and open our lives into this shared ministry that, that we're all in together. So give generously to whatever makes you feel joy. And, and we hope and pray that part of that is the ministry and mission of Robinsdale Parkway United Church of Christ. But the point is that we're giving and finding a way to make a difference in the world.
Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the unison prayer of dedication. With awe and wonder before you, O God, we dare to give our gifts and our lives into this service. Where there is injustice, we would champion those oppressed and misunderstood. When there is rejection, we would reach out in love. May these offerings and our lives preach, teach, and heal. Amen. And let us remember that as we tell our stories, our truth, where we come from, our histories combined with others so that we can all learn and grow in liberation and love, that is our covenant and our promise. Just like Abram learned that he was present because of God's promises to him. Amen. 